a whole boatload of Maya history. But isn't there something you can do? It's too late. It'll be through that reef soon. Free and clear. How much did that crook get away with? We didn't have much time to check, but plenty. That's good. That's good. You're right on course. I'm left a little bit. You sure? Yeah, we're lined up perfectly. That doesn't make sense. Get out of the way. Where's Mimi? She's hiding, up the coast. The looters are getting away. Looks that way, doesn't it? But I think old Harvey Baby's gonna have some navigation problems. What? Just watch. Another 50 meters and we're home free. Yeah, home free. the channel. <laughs> He's stuck on the reef. Oh, <laughs> oh, hey, there's the Federal Roberts. And right on time. All right. That's still leaves one big question. How did you know that Westerman would, as you put it, have navigation problems? Because Russ and I messed up his navigation system. We moved his lighthouse fire. A couple of feet made all the difference. When he lined up with the temple and the fire, we put him on the wrong course. Good job, mate. So I do clever. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> Way to go, you guys. They are from the village. They say they are tired of people stealing their past. You guys are going to be spending some time in jail. Maybe, but not as much time as Mr. Westerman. I can tell you all about Mr. Westerman. Gee, nasty accident you had there. Guess that's what you get when you play with fire. That's what he gets when we play with fire. <laughs> you know, I don't understand you. Working for peanuts to dig up relics that are worth thousands just to turn over to some museum. You're all suckers. I'd say you're in a strange position to be calling us suckers. Boss. See ya, Harv. Don't forget to write. Well, Segovia, this calls for a celebration, I think. <laughs> you will be my guest. Gracias. Yeah, thank I'll you. I'll pick something up. Uh-uh. Uh <laughs> I hope you have lots of water, Segovia. <laughs> I hope you have lots of fire extinguishers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, say, Segovia. Si, Capitan. How did that theory of yours work out? Did that little temple ever mark the winter solstice? The coast was covered in clouds every day. Every day. But that little temple has been marking the winter solstice for a thousand years. I'm sure of it. I'll be back next year. You don't give up easily, do you? No. Would you? No. We spent the next couple of days in Merida making a report to the authorities. George and Jean had to stay there, though. Too bad, because we got to come back here to take a closer look at the lost, I mean, found city.
Hey, Kiche, Siti. Come on. Terry and Victor say it was definitely a major city. Oh, wow. Can we go in? We sure can. in here, are they? Probably. Victor, look at this. What is it? A drywall. Could it be a tomb? Maybe. Can we open it? What do you think? We have the permission. Dale, run. Go get the others. Grandpa! Oh. Grandpa! <laughs> I can't believe Westerman missed this. He may be a crude, but he knew what he was doing. Well, he was in a hurry, I guess. Anyhow, he probably found plenty right here in this room. Mm -hmm. Sure is exciting. Hope there's nothing live in there. <clears throat> I guess I'm not too crazy about anything dead, either. It is a tomb. Whoa, a skeleton. Look at that jade death mask. It's Chuck Belong. What? What do you mean, honey? Look. Look, Mom, it's Chuck Belong. There's a calendar date. On the day, 11 Kowak. Two Mac was captured. Chuck Balam of Koba. Count forward one Winal and two tunes to his, uh. What do you call that word when someone becomes king? Accession. Oh, yeah, accession. And to his accession as Lord of Sight You. <laughs> Lost king for a lost city. And a very lucky fellow. I don't get it. Wasn't Blom a prisoner? I mean, wouldn't he be sacrificed? Well, you'd think so, but it seems that this prisoner got out of losing his heart by going to work. Work? Doing the only job he knew. Being king. If these people lost their king and needed a new one in a hurry, they might turn to any royal blood they could find. And the two royal families from here and Koba could have been related. We know this is true from other sides. That could really happen? It'd be a new one. They might just have felt that he deserved King's burial, even if he was a captive king. Yeah. It's all guesswork for now, City. And some folks will spend their years fighting the mosquitoes just like us. <laughs> and maybe in 10 years, with a lot of luck, they'll turn up an answer or two. I wouldn't mind doing that. Neither would I, CT.
more day and Westerman probably would have broken into that tomb. We would have never known what happened to Chalk Balam. Yeah. <laughs> you think this place will become a tourist attraction? <laughs> Not for a long time. It's kind of off the beaten track. They said this. Buenos dias, Abram. Who's that? A friend CT and Kiche made at the village. My baseball. Buenos dias, Abram. Yeah. Hey, Abram. What's this? Well, it's for you. Huh? You couldn't keep his first present, and I wanted to give you a going away present. We got Mom to make it for you. Just like my pot. It's a copy of your pot. The one that led us here in the first place. But uh, how did you guys? We made it in Merida. It has the same glyphs as the original, but Kiche put an extra glyph on it. Let me show it to you. And the Mimi Two glyph. Yep. <sighs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> and no hole. <laughs> so, now we're back in Tulum. Today, Terry and Victor will be picking up where they left off. Christmas. Mañana voy a casa. Tomorrow I go home. I'm sure I'm gonna miss everybody. Hey, aren't you coming? Come on in. Yeah. Come on, Siti, let's go in. What are you writing, anyhow? Well. I was just writing about uh, how much I'm going to miss you guys. I am, too. You still have a day for saying goodbyes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, aren't you coming? Come on in. Yeah. Last one in swabs the decks. Wait a minute, one more line. Oh, come on, chicken, let's go in. What's this Woo. one more line bit? Woo! Hasta <laughs> luego. Hasta luego. Hold on, Siti. Well, I guess you swap the deck one more time. No way, with the top. just what all the ancient Mayan temples were used for. But they do know that some of them were probably for religious ceremonies. Hi, I'm Ben Affleck. And this modern day temple is the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. A Gothic cathedral may not look much like a Maya temple, but in one way they are similar. Like all the Maya temples, St. John is built of thousands of limestone blocks. 
Limestone was formed long ago at the bottom of great seas. Over millions of years, the shells and skeletons of millions of sea creatures piled up on the bottom. As the pile got bigger and heavier, they crushed and compacted into solid rock. Sometimes you can still find the fossils of these creatures in the stone. The limestone for the cathedral is from deep quarries in Indiana. Huge chunks of it are cut from the quarry walls and trucked all the way to New York. It's hard to imagine how the Maya did this. They didn't even use animals to help them move the blocks. No one can say much about how the Maya managed to build their great temples. Even now, it takes a long time to complete a cathedral. In fact, this one's been under construction for nearly a hundred years. When it's finished, it will be the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. But that may take another hundred years, partly because a lot of the work is still being done by hand, just the way they've built cathedrals for the last eight centuries. Right now, they're working on one of the two big towers to be built on the front of the building. Each block has to be individually cut and carved and then hoisted into place. The shop where the stone is cut is right next to the cathedral, and the man who is in charge of the cutting is a master stonemason from England named Alan Bird. Well, I think the best way for me to explain what happens to us here in the stone yard, Ben, is to actually t follow the life of one stone in particular, right the way from the quarry as we get it here in the rough block, and we'll follow it right through until we actually set it on the tower. You might say each block starts out as a piece of paper, because for each one, there's a card that has the dimensions of the block. It's kind of a recipe or blueprint of how to make it. The block we decided to follow is called a gablet block, and it will fit into the tower right here. The first step in shaping the block uses some machinery the Maya builders might have appreciated. It's a diamond tooth gang saw, and it can cut right through stone. What's the point of putting diamonds in the teeth? Diamond is much harder than steel. It cuts fairly accurately, and also it, it, it's very durable. It lasts a long, long time. OK, Ben, if you could give me a hand here with a square, and we just square this line for the primary cut. OK, hold tight there. The blade would overheat from friction if it weren't cooled, and the cooling water also helps keep the dust down. The gang saw cuts at the rate of six inches per hour. Not real fast, but it still beats cutting it by hand. You guide it through nice and steady. Now, the actual shape of the block is drawn on each of its sides using life-size patterns cut from zinc. The template is basically a pattern. And this gives you the shape and all what it takes to cut this stone. You'll see that when we put this on, this is going to fit. Pedro's going to cut a lot of this waste material. We don't need this for this stone. So he's going to cut that out. Finer cuts are made on a smaller diamond tooth saw that cuts a lot faster than the gang saw. Operating the saw reminded me again how incredible it is that the Maya built everything without the help of such things as motors. Just put your After several cuts were made, we could just knock out the unwanted parts of the block. Oh, you got three at once. Pretty good <laughs> shot. All right, let's pass them down to Pedro. Just take them off now. Give them to Pedro. Next stop, the cutting banker, or bench, where the handwork begins. First, more big chunks of stone are chipped away with a large chisel. This is called pitching. We're just pitching away the waste we don't want. You know? OK. Now, I think we're ready now. You can have a little. Uh, Crack with the gun and see how you get on. All right? All right. So we've got to get rid of this. So you just, just hold it. That's good. And just rest this on the stone. All right? Uh -huh. Okay, now, now gently press. A bit more of an angle. Up, up on your right hand. Up on your right hand. There, you got it. You got it. 
Okay, and then push. As you go in a little deeper, push. That's it. How did it look? Not so easy, huh? Uh, we're making stonemason out of you yet. One of Alan's apprentices, or students, put the finishing touches on the block. You were working at about at this height, bringing this down. Okay, now Carol's finished all this, and she's now working on the nose line. So this is the same stone we were doing, except That's she right. cleared all this out. She's cleared it all out. So is, uh, is he a good teacher? He's a very good teacher. Yeah? Ah, come on, you're only saying that because I'm here. <laughs> no, I'm Give me not, a break, Alan. Carol. You're a good teacher, <laughs> Alan. I'd send my grandchildren here, providing I have any. Alan started learning to cut stone when he was just 16. He wasn't doing so well in school, but when they sent him to college as part of his apprenticeship, things were different for him. And learning to cut stone helped you do better in school? When I was young and in school, I couldn't see much purpose to what I was being taught. And having gone and done well at a craft such as stone cutting, it suddenly made sense to me. There was a definite reason for it all. And it felt good, you know, for the first time. And it, it took something like a piece of stone to make me realize that things like geometry and mathematics really made a lot of sense and that I could get a lot of satisfaction out of it and you know and a lot of love for what I do. Now the cutting is finished and the block is ready to have a design carved on it. To move it to the carving shed we had to put a hole in it first. Then a gadget called a Lewis pin is inserted into the hole. When the pin is lifted from the top, it tries to spread apart at the bottom and presses against the sides of the hole. Just put it in right like that, right? Yep, all the way. Beautiful. Okay, see, now we're coming up nice and even, you know? The work in the carving shed is different from the cutting shop. Here, no power tools are used, and the work is more delicate. The carver assigned to finish the job on our block is Cine Linton. This is a model of the carving. I'm not going to copy it exactly because it's not the same size, uh -huh. but I'm going to refer to it. Mm -hmm. Before she learned to carve, Cine spent four years in the cutting shop as Alan's first apprentice. Sometimes I miss being over there because this is a lot of little work, little tapping. Over there you can really pound away at what you're doing. There you have templates and you know exactly what you're supposed to come out with. <laughs> and you can measure it and check it all along the way. But when the chance came to come in here, I thought I'd try it and I really like it. Do you ever make really big mistakes? Oh, not too often. What would a uh, big mistake be? A big mistake would be if I were hitting along here and I knocked this whole leaf off. <laughs> that would be a big mistake. And I feel like I'll be learning for, for years and years and years. I probably will be here for, for 25 years. <laughs> Get a gold watch. that you made this for two days, you know? With your own, just your own hammer and chisel. When a block is finished, it's marked off on a large drawing of the cathedral tower. Each color represents a different person's work, so mine is purple. So that's it. That's the block you just did? Yep. Number 260. My Sinian. This block was getting to be an old friend. So Alan suggested I carve something on it where it wouldn't show. And he taught me how to do it. All right. All right. Let's see Take what you can do. Away you go. All right. All right. Keep the angle. Keep the angle up. Be positive, Ben. Be positive. <laughs> The block gets an elevator ride to the top of the cathedral. Imagine how they did this a hundred years ago. 
Imagine how the Maya did it 1,500 years ago. How high up is this? Uh, we're gonna go up about 160 feet. <laughs> this is high. This is high. No, just get off the road. Ben's doing all the muscle work here today. Pulleys and an overhead track, along with another Lewis pin, make easy work of getting the block in place. Where's it going to go? Uh, the stone's going to go here. Uh -huh. This carving will line up with, with this one. And the, the corner here will line up with here. A thin bed of a kind of cement called mortar is all that holds the blocks together. Our block weighs about 550 pounds, so it isn't likely to blow away. How long will it take to finish the whole cathedral? Oh, I don't think you or I are going to be alive to see that day. <laughs> Cathedrals in general take a centuries. So I always tell my guys, you know, it's one stone at a time. <laughs> so if you complete one stone, then you've achieved something. So, 300 million years ago, this block was nothing but a bunch of sea creatures. Six months ago, it was part of a wall of limestone in an Indiana quarry. Now, after 30 hours of cutting and shaping, it goes into place high up on the South Tower of St. John. You never know. Maybe 1,500 years from now, archaeologists will be scratching their heads, wondering about this temple and our block and that strange inscription in ancient English, Mimi. <laughs>